Uh, I'd like to start by first thanking the Nexus organizers, and particularly Jan, who will be following my presentation. And I also want to thank and acknowledge Stephen Novella and David Gorski, whose writing inspired me to start my own blogging, and um, which eventually led to me to be invited to be a contributor to the Science-Based Medicine blog. And um, I love to write about science and medicine really for the same reason that I, like, uh, that I went into pharmacy school, which was to help people make better health decisions. And my work as a pharmacist has changed from focusing on one patient at a time into looking at more population level health, and that's really what inspired me to start blogging. Um, and I've seen the growing demand for and use of uh, complementary and alternative medicines or supplements uh, in pharmacies like the one pictured here. Supplements are very big business, and I hope that by the time I'm done, and after Jan's talk as well, that you'll see that I have why we have serious concerns about supplement safety and how the regulatory framework and the way that supplements and complementary and alternative medicines are marketed actually detracts and makes it very difficult to use supplements in a science-based way. So before we proceed, I want to note the following. So first, that I have no financial or other conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, this presentation is my own. It's prepared, for me in, prepared by me in my own capacity, and any opinions that I express are those of my own, my own opinions, and they don't represent any organizations that I work with or for. So there's thousands of supplements on the market, and if I was to focus on a single one, I could probably take 30 minutes easily going over the science of that. So I'm going to take a slightly different tactic. Being skeptics, I already assume that you're familiar with the term ask for evidence. And so what I want to do is focus on some of the underlying chemical issues and, and pharmacokinetic issues in particular that I look at from a pharmacy perspective when evaluating claims for supplements. And um, I want to stake out really several positions and observations that I think anyone can agree upon, whether you're very pro-supplement or whether you're concerned about supplement use. I think because of the ability for people to buy and choose products for their own health is an important one, but it's one where consumers, I believe, are facing a very unfair marketplace. And so in doing so, I want to give you a pharmacist's perspective that I hope will make you better skeptics overall. So my, my overview is going to be the following. I'll start with talking a little bit about what supplements are, how they're alike, and how they're very similar to drug products, and then I'll, I'll speak a bit about why supplements and drugs are actually different in many ways. Finally, I'll talk about whether we can use supplements safely and, and how, how we can go about doing so. Jan's going to focus on the regulation of supplements, and she'll talk about a little bit more about the effects and the consequences of, of regulation. We all love the idea of a risk-free magic bullet that improves our health and wellness, especially one that's presumed to be good for you, healthy, without side effects, and beneficial. And that's really a product of the marketing more than anything else for dietary supplements. There's no question that marketing's been effective. I've had patients come in to speak to me when they're in a pharmacy, they've been prescribed a drug, and they ask for a supplement instead because they simply believe that the supplement is going to be safer for them rather than taking a drug which has been prescribed and actually been tested and evaluated to be effective for the condition that they're treating. And they look, they look a lot alike. When you, when you go into a pharmacy, you can see them side by side on, on, the, on the shelves. And they may actually be marketed for the same conditions as well. But whether the chemicals in a particular product are considered a drug or whether they're considered a supplement can really have dramatic differences in terms of whether or not there's evidence to justify their sale, the presence of any safety studies, how the products are actually being manufactured, what manufacturers can claim about them, and really most importantly, the overall quality of that product. And most countries have sought to distinguish supplements from drugs in, in some way, um, recognizing that consumers are demanding access to products that they perceive to be beneficial and safe. And each country has taken a slightly different approach. So the FDA says that a dietary supplement is a product that's taken by mouth, that's intended to supplement the diet that contains one or more dietary ingredients. And these are the categories that are generally considered to be supplements. I put plus or minus homeopathy at the bottom because homeopathy is not considered a supplement. It, it undergoes, it's subject to different regulations in the United States, but in other jurisdictions, particularly in Canada, so homeopathy is lumped in with what are called natural health products. So it's, there's, there's different approaches, but by and large, these are the categories of the products. What's interesting is that supplements can also simultaneously be drugs. They have medicinal effects and they can have side effects. And many prescription drugs actually have plant or um, natural roots, and yet we don't necessarily consider a drug to be a supplement. And they don't, have, they don't have to be natural at all. They can be completely synthetic. So where do we draw the line between a supplement and a drug? In general, these are kind of the, the following rules that apply. 
Um, supplements are generally considered safe until they're proven unsafe. They're intended to supplement the diet. They're not explicitly intended from a regulatory perspective to treat, diagnose, or cure, but the marketing says otherwise. And in general, there's less regulatory oversight for dietary supplements. On the other hand, drug products are considered to be unsafe until they're proven to be safe. They're generally taken for a specific therapeutic purpose, that is to treat, diagnose, or cure a condition. And they can be taken by mouth, but drugs are also injected. And there's much more strict regulatory oversight. And by and large, this, will, this, this, this is the case in most countries, although there are differences in terms of the overall approach. When you think about from the, the prior category here, when you look at these products, you can see that the, the approach that's taken really falls apart when you look at the products that are being considered supplements. So you can take the, the herbal remedies, for example. Herbs are considered supplements. And supplements are considered to supposed to be taken to supplement the diet. But there's no nutritional need to supplement the diet with herbal remedies. Um, people tend to take herbs because of what they believe are medicinal or um, bio biological effects that they hope to have occur from taking herbal medicine. So if we take an herbal remedy, we're generally taking it for some presumed drug-like effect. Yet the herbs ha are subject to very different regulatory oversight and manufacturing standards with respect to drug products. And it's interesting, the, the difference between um, what a, what's a drug and what's an herb or what's a supplement can vary fairly dramatically. So if it sounds like an artificial distinction, you're right. So here's a couple of categories, two ways to look at this. So the first one I want to mention is vitamin A. So vitamin A is found naturally in food products, so liver, fish, um, milk, and eggs. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, so it actually accumulates in the body if you take excessive amounts. Um, deficiency is very rare in the United States, but it's very common in developing countries. Um, it's a routine ingredient in multivitamins. Um, yet it's also used, it's also a prescription drug. So vitamin A in different forms and in different strengths is used as a prescription drug. Um, it's used to treat acne, cancer, and anemia. And side effects from vitamin A can be severe. They can include um, birth defects and liver toxicity. So really, whether or not it's a, a, a supplement or a drug is, is subject to a number of factors. The underlying chemical may be exactly the same. The second example is, is another interesting one, which is melatonin. Melatonin is a naturally produced hormone, but um, the product that you would buy on the shelf is actually almost all of it is synthetic. Um, it's found in some foods, and that's why it's considered to be a dietary supplement, but it, and it's marketed as a natural supplement. And it's actually the only hormone that's available in the United States without a prescription. Um, it is, does have prescription status in other countries. Um, and it's used for a variety of different sleep-wake disorders. It seems to have the most evidence to support it for the use of, um, for, for jet lag. Um, and it's interesting that long-term effects, particularly in, in children, are really not that well understood. And yet it's marketed and it's sold freely as a dietary supplement. So now I want to talk a little bit about how supplements and drugs are alike. And as I said, I think that there's some areas where I think as, as consumers or as health professionals, these are, these are things that we could probably all agree on, that we typically want when we take a product, that we want it to be absorbed into the body. We want that substance to get to where it needs to go in the body. We want that substance to have some sort of an effect in the body, hopefully beneficial, and then we want it to be not harmful to us. We don't want there to be any side effects, and we don't want there to be any toxicity. And I think that if you're an advocate for supplements or you're concerned about supplement use, I think we could all agree those are probably reasonable things that any consumer would want. Um, and so when we think about supplements and we're taking supplements as, as, and consuming them, there are several um, different things that we think about from a pharmacologic perspective. And in this case, I'll, I'll probably slip and call them drug products because when we look at this that we're taking a chemical and we're ingesting it into the body, there are certain um, barriers that any product or chemical will, will face. And so from a pharmacy perspective, we spend a lot of time talking about this in pharmacy school, which is called, um, sometimes called ADME. And I'll walk through a bit of this in terms of from a drug design perspective, but all of these rules are equally applicable to supplements. So this is the science of, called pharmacokinetics. And while it's not necessary to understand the intricacies, knowing a little bit about pharmacokinetics and how chemicals behave when you ingest them will help you evaluate supplement claims more effectively. So when you swallow a substance, the following is presumed to occur, unless that substance isn't absorbed at all. So you, you're ingesting it, it has to be absorbed, it's distributed through the body, through the bloodstream, it's metabolized, and then it's eliminated from the body. And I'm gonna walk through each of these in a little bit more detail, and then we'll talk about how that's useful when evaluating supplement claims and, and looking at trying to determine whether or not a particular supplement is effective. So first I'll talk about absorption. Um, so the rate and extent of absorption really depends on the route of administration and the, and the formulation. How is the product actually packaged? And it's really a function of the chemical properties of the drug and any physiologic properties. And this is one of the first questions that, that I ask when I'm told that a particular supplement has worked, which is, is this product even absorbed? 
And so in the, in the graph on the right, you can see what would happen if you injected a product into the bloodstream versus if you ingest it orally. Um, what happens is some of that product is generally not absorbed into the body because it may be distort, destroyed by stomach, stomach acids, and that the absorption is delayed, and then it's slowly eliminated. Unless you have some way of measuring whether a product is actually going into the bloodstream, you don't actually know that there's any absorption occurring at all. And um, it's important to note that um, any substance, whether it's a drug product or a supplement, has to survive what's called the first pass effect. So that means that as the, 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 as the substances are absorbed into the bloodstream through the intestine, it first, that, that blood flow first goes through to the liver. And the liver does everything it can to eliminate any substance that is perceived to be foreign or toxic, whether that's a drug or a supplement, the same rules apply. So the liver does everything it can to metabolize that product before it reaches the general circulation. That's called the first pass effect. It's a significant issue for drugs because if we can't get drugs to pass, survive the first pass effect when they're absorbed, they don't reach the bloodstream, they won't have any effect at all. The same applies for supplements, and this is one of the questions that we ask about wh whether a product is even absorbed. Here's an ad I took last weekend. You can see I was, I was out for a run with, uh, with someone, and I, I stopped by a health food store, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but take a photo, a picture of this particular ad. This is an ad for um, curcumin, which is um, a, a chemical found within turmeric, and it's a popular suppl supplement, but it seems that this product is actually not very well absorbed, and so this particular supplement manufacturer is advertising 300, better times, 300 times higher absorption than regular curcumin. So presumably they're measuring this, although I couldn't find any trials um, when I was searching online to actually find the trials, and what you would actually have to do is measure the bloodstream concentrations of curcumin, giving two different kinds of supplements, and that's how you would actually demonstrate that a product is being better absorbed. Presumably, uh, and I'm, I was looking at the, the manufacturing materials, the manufacturer is claiming that the particles are ground up smaller, and so that product is reaching the uh, bloodstream because it's dissolving into solution. Unless the substance actually dissolves in, in the gastric juices, it's not absorbed at all. So there's some plausibility to that, Potentially, formulation could have an effect on the absorption. There's not a lot of information here to evaluate whether or not that means anything, but let's, well, I'll come back to the curcumin example in a moment. The next is distribution, which is where is the supplement or drug actually working within the body? So once, as I said, once a substance is absorbed, it has to be carried through the body through the bloodstream, and not all substances are dis distributed equally to all parts of the body. I mentioned vitamin A earlier. That's a substance that's fat Fat, sol fat soluble, so it deposits in the fat and accumulates in the fat. Other substances may not uh, reach all parts of the body. Um, one of the issues that we find with drug design is that some drugs bind very tightly to proteins in the bloodstream, and that reduces the amount of free drug in the blood. And it's the amount of free drug in the blood that is actually available to have some sort of a beneficial medicinal effect. The same rules apply for when you're taking a supplement, and this is a question that we have when we're trying to evaluate whether or not a supplement is actually having any medicinal effects, is, is this substance being distributed through the bloodstream? So if you think about, say, um, a product that's being marketed for joint pain that's claimed to, to get into the capsule of the joint um, or get right in, into the joint or in the tissue around there, that's a question that we would have to say, how do we know that the substance is actually even reaching that, that place of action where it's presumed to be having a beneficial effect? The, the concerns are very different if you're applying a supplement, say, as a topical agent. So if you're applying something directly to a wound, you don't really have that concern about being distribu distributed there because you know that it's actually, you're applying it directly to the site of action. But when you're ingesting something, where it's distributed in the body is something that we think about from a drug perspective, and it's something to equally think about from a supplement perspective. The next area is metabolism. Uh, as I said, foreign substances are excreted typically by the kidneys or also within the bile. And the, the body has very sophisticated mechanisms to eliminate substances. The body can't distinguish whether a supplement is a natural product or it's a drug, synthetic drug. There is just a, there's a series of enzymes in the, in the body that will, atta will attack different molecules and convert them into forms that can be more easily excreted. Um, what's interesting is with respect to, um, this, this is actually true detoxification, not the detoxification that you've heard earlier this morning, and we'll be talking about the rest of the day. This is the true detoxification of chemicals that actually is very important to us, so that when we eat, when we ingest something that could potentially kill us, the body has developed these sophisticated mechanisms um, through, evolution, through evolution in order for us to not die. Um, so when we think about the, the metabolism, um, the, the ability to metabolize a particular substance can be influenced by things like genetics and age. And we think about this from a drug perspective all the time. So you may, you know, I put the example there. So um, 
some Asians have difficulty metabolizing alcohol, and you can see the, the, the facial flushing when that occurs when, when they ingest alcohol. You can also look at the, with respect to how drugs behave, may behave very differently when you're giving them to very young people, so in pediatric populations or in, in seniors and, and older adults. All of those equally apply when we're considering the, the efficacy and safety of supplements as well. And the downside is that those, those types of populations are generally not studied at all. And we are, as, as in, when we're trying to evaluate claims, it's very difficult for us. And it, we, have to very, we have to pause and hesitate before we extrapolate any evidence in one population to another. It's something we do with drug products all the time, but something that rarely occurs in the supplement, supplement field. Lastly, there's elimination or excretion. And as I said, a substance needs to be eliminated to prevent toxicity. Otherwise, the concentrations would continue to rise in the body and cause harm. Um, when we think about, as I said, the kidneys are the main form of, of um, the main route of elimination for substances because the, the liver is transforming substances that are then easier to excrete through the kidneys. But um, stool, the lungs, breast milk can be secondary routes for drug, drug elimination and also supplement elimination. It's, um, it's important to keep in mind that in patients who have either kidney dysfunction or liver dysfunction, it can have a significant effect not only on their health, just from having that underlying dysfunction, but it can have a dramatic effect on whether or not different drugs can be used safely and effectively in that population. There's no reason to think that any of that would not be the case for supplements. And again, we're often stuck with a, a significant lack of information in order to evaluate whether or not those products can be used safely and effectively. So, what we're left with is, this is the therapeutic window, and this is one that we use with drug products all the time, but it's equally effective and equally relevant for, for supplements. And that, so presumably when we, take, when we take a product and we ingest it into our, into the, into our body, that it's absorbed, it reach, has a peak effect, and then it's slowly eliminated from the body over time through metabolism. Um, the, the product presumably will have an effect at a, what's called the minimum effective concentration, which is the lower of the horizontal lines, and we want it to have a beneficial effect um, and then the, the MEC for the um, adverse response is what we don't want to occur. So that's where we have the concentration at which a product starts to cause harm. And when we look at this from a drug design perspective, that's really what we're looking at with any drug, is we're trying to determine, can we, ha can we give a substance into the body? Can it have a beneficial effect in people without causing harm or toxicity? And this is the type of graph that we look at when we're looking at, is this, how is this product absorbed? What's the appropriate dose? How should this product be given? And um, how do we keep the duration of action? And how do we uh, measure that in, in patients in order to ensure that a product is being, can be used safely and effectively? And yet again, with supplements, we're really left with a lack of information about whether or not any of these questions can be answered. And here's an example of toxicity from a natural product, which was, um, you, may, you may be familiar with this, this fellow. His name's Gary Null. He's a supplement um, advocate and, and seller, actually. And he was actually poisoned by his own brand of supplement because he, um, the manufacturer had actually put in um, an excessive amount of vitamin D in that product and he was actually nearly killed by his own supplement. Um, so he's actually uh, suing his own, the, the company that manufactures his own supplements. It's nearly impossible to overdose on vitamin D, but Gary Null um, almost did it. What this is a, a cautionary tale about is not only the fact that all substances can have toxic, toxic effects, but it really speaks about the underlying quality of the products that are being sold. And I, um, I'll come back to that, and I think Jan will be talking about that as well. So I want to go back to the, the curcumin example. And I was curious about that ad that I saw in, in the health food store window. And so I was pulling some information about bioavailability because I thought, why are they claiming that this product is absorbed and that this product is, is better? So I found this particular paper, and I've just highlighted a section here that I'll read to you, which says that, Phase one clinical trials have shown that curcumin is safe even at high doses, but exhibits poor bioavailability. That is, it's not absorbed. They're saying major reasons contributing to the low plasma levels of curcumin appear to be due to poor absorption, rapid metabolism, and rapid systemic elimination. So when I can think back to that particular ad, you can say, okay, well, I know that that substance is presumably, I'll assume that that product is being better absorbed. But you can see there's underlying factors here that may actually prevent curcumin from having any beneficial effect. If the body is eliminating it rapidly, transforming it rapidly, and eliminating it quickly, then there's really not a lot of information to suggest that that drug or that chemical is actually going to have any medicinal effects in the body at all. But what this is really interesting, and this is when we start to think about the potential for this product. If this particular chemical has medicinal properties that we think are beneficial, and this is important from a development perspective because it may be that we can modify this particular chemical structure of this product and actually make it into something that is beneficial, that does stay in the body, that isn't eliminated rapidly, that does have beneficial effects. But 
At that point, if we transform it, at a certain point, it'll become a drug product and it'll be treated differently. And then from the perspective of, if you're a very strong supplement advocate, you may not find, you may not feel that it's natural or healthy or safe anymore. But in fact, when we look at it from a pharmacologic perspective, there may be very good reasons to consider that a, a drug product may actually be superior to a supplement. So I wanted to talk another, give you another example here with a, one of my favorite favorite blogging topics because of the hate mail that I get when I talk about this topic because it's an essential oil. So this is oil of oregano and I think I actually entitled one of my posts, is there anything oil of oregano can't cure? And I think that's a great point because if you look at the marketing materials for oil of oregano, it is claimed to cure absolutely everything. It is believed to have magical healing properties that is simultaneously anti-parasitic, antiviral, antibacterial. You can basically use it for anything. You can apply it to surfaces and um, there is really nothing that oil of oregano is not claimed to do. And we can assess the plausibility of oil of oregano without even actually looking at any clinical trials at all. Because I think, and what's important is that the dose matters. You know, just like if you put alcohol in your hand to kill, you can put alcohol in your hand and it will kill viruses and parasites and, um, and bacteria in your hand, but no number of margaritas that you drink will have an effect on your cold. And the reason is that the dose matters you cannot extrapolate the in vitro or test tube evidence into what you believe to be occurring in, when you're ingesting a particular product. So there's no amount of alcohol that you drink that won't kill you first that is going to cure your cold, even though you can destroy cold viruses with alcohol in your hand. So when I think about oil of oregano and the properties, and, I'll, and again, I haven't, I'm not gonna talk about the actual trials here, but I just think from a plausibility perspective, I would say, well, if you're going to apply oil of oregano, which has some interesting chemical compounds as a disinfectant on a surface, then I would say, yeah, that's probably more plausible. Or let's say it's claimed to treat toenail fungus. Again, I don't know if there's clinical trials to show that that's effective, but I would say, well, if you're applying it directly onto the site of infection and you're getting it at sufficiently high concentrations, I would say that's probably plausible. Um, and the same would go for any type of skin infections as well. Again, not looking at the trials themselves, but I would just say that from the perspective of what are we applying, what are the concentrations, and is it possible that a chemical could have that effect? I would say, sure, maybe it's plausible that oil of oregano could have those effects. But when we start talking about ingestion, distribution through the body, and um, the use for things like respiratory infections or urinary tract infections, this is where I start having questions about, is the product absorbed? How, long, how much is, is distributed through the body? Does it reach sufficient concentrations in the tissue where an infection occurs? Are we giving it in, at sufficient intervals in order for the an infection to be resolved? Many of you, I'm sure, have taken antibiotics and you know that you generally have to take them, in many cases, two or three times a day for several days in a row. And that's because we've looked at the pharmacokinetics. We know the concentrations at which the antibiotic has to reach within the bloodstream in order to have a measured effect in the body of resolving an infection. With oil of oregano, there's no information to suggest that any of that has been measured or even evaluated. And so I would say that that would be much less, much less plausible compared to some of the other infections. The other important point to keep in mind is that drugs are chemicals and they can have inter drug interactions with, with drugs uh, just like any other substance. And so supplements can affect the absorption, distribution, metaboli metabolism, and elimination of drug products as well. So calcium will bind drugs right in the gastrointestinal tract and actually prevent their absorption. Uh, a supplement called quercetin can displace the protein binding of a drug called warfarin, which increases the amount of free warfarin in the blood, which increases the risk of bleeding. Um, ginseng, like many other supplements, has an effect on the enzymes in the liver and will affect the metabolism of some drugs. St. John's wort and birth control is a good example. St. John's wort actually terrifies pharmacists. If you say to your pharmacist, I'm on prescription drugs and I wanna take St. John's wort because St. John's wort is a notorious uh, substance that causes interactions with many, many drugs, and it's very difficult to predict the effects. There's also additive effects po are possible as well. So um, if you're taking combinations of warfarin, aspirin, vitamin E, ginkgo biloba, taken together, they have been shown to collectively increase the risk of bleeding compared to taking the, the drug products alone. The body doesn't know and the body doesn't care. You're ingesting substances and chemicals, and the body is trying to eliminate those as quickly as it can, anything it perceives as foreign. Particularly when you're taking drug products, the risk of supplements is quite a bit higher just because of the unpredictable nature of supplements. So now I want to talk a little bit about how supplements and drugs actually differ. And I want to use an example here. This is something that we really think about when I'm, when, when I'm asked to evaluate claims for supplement benefit and I'm contrasting it with a drug product. And I've just pulled an example here, and this is a trial back from, I think, 
2003 that was looking at a, a statin drug called atorvastatin that showed that atorvastatin had certain properties um, in terms of specific outcomes. And on the bottom left, I've shown the product there, atorvastatin is Lipitor. And what's, what we, when, we, when we're looking at clinical evidence and we're trying to extrapolate it into whether that clinical evidence actually is meaningful to us, we have to draw, we have to draw an inference between what was studied in the clinical trial and what you're actually taking or dispensing in the pharmacy. And so manufacturers, when they, when they put a drug through clinical trials and then they go to propose to sell that drug on the marketplace after they've reached FDA approval, manufacturers are required to show that the formulation of the product that they're going to sell is identical to and behaves exactly the same way from a pharmacokinetic perspective as the, as the drug that was in the clinical trial. And in fact, manufacturers are required to demonstrate that any changes in the formulation will not affect the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, or the elimination of the drug, or they may be required by the FDA to do additional clinical trials to show that the evidence, in this case, this particular clinical trial, is relevant to the information that we're using to make a determination as to whether or not to take a product. And when a generic drug comes along, and I've just shown one of the generics of atorvastatin on the right, the generic manufacturers are required to demonstrate that their product dissolves and is metabolized and absorbed in the same way and eliminated in the same way as the brand product. And so when we're providing a drug in the pharmacy, we can look and say, we, can, we have confidence that the information that we're using to guide decision making, to help patients make decisions about whether or not to take a particular drug, are informed by, and the, informed by the clinical trials and that those clinical trials are relevant. Unfortunately, none of this occurs in the supplement, in the supplement industry, and we simply do not have that information, uh, in particular, with herbal remedies. And the biggest concern with, with herbal remedies and supplements overall is that there are four factors that we need to think about, which is the identity, the purity, the potency, and the stability. All of those are problematic when we're evaluating supplements. Some of them are due to the nature of them being supplements themselves, and some of them are due to regulatory perspectives. And I think that the biggest question that we have with many supplements is what is the active ingredient? This is particularly an issue with herbal remedies, and I've, so I've stratified it here into drugs and sub, some supplements on the left and the herbals and botanicals on, on, the, on the right. So with drugs and some supplements, so let's, let's say for example a multivitamin or a single, a single ingredient vitamin, we know, what the, we know what the active ingredient is and we can actually measure it in the bloodstream as I showed you earlier. These are typically measured synth uh, manufactured synthetically. We can, we can measure and assay the quantity per tablet or capsule, and the uniformity, uniformity and consistency is measurable. They will do dissolution tests of those products to ensure that they dissolve at the, at the appropriate time and that they're absorbed fully. And we can actually measure the amount, of, the amount in the bloodstream and the amount that is absorbed. On the other hand, with herbals and botanicals, we're really stuck with a deficit of information in that you know, what is the product that's actually being sold? What is the active ingredient? How has the plant actually been authenticated? What part of the plant is included in that, in that remedy? Is it the leaf, the stem, the flower, the root, the seed? How has a product been prepared? And really importantly, has there ever been an active ingredient even identified? Because if we don't know what the active ingredient is in a particular herbal remedy, we can't actually measure to show that it's there and then we can't make any inference about whether or not a particular clinical trial with a particular herbal remedy is even relevant because we have no idea if there's been, never been an active ingredient identified that that active ingredient is actually in the product given the different ways that it can be manufactured. The second piece, uh, second concern is really is a product free of contaminants. And um, Jan will be speaking a bit more about this, but in general drug products must meet FDA, FDA standards um, which are good manufacturing practices or GMP. Supplement manufacturers are required to follow those standards, but there may be no purity standards, and it's also very difficult to identify contaminants. Some products are easier to test than others, but unless you know what you're looking for in a particular supplement, it's difficult to test for it. And I've just pulled a couple of stories here. FDA inspections really revealed different stories around this. When we, when we this is a, the first report is one from 2012, and you can see um, this was written up in uh, the Chicago Tribu Tribune. The inspection reports portray an industry struggling to meet basic manufacturing standards from verifying the identity of their ingredients that go into the products to inspecting finished batches of supplements. Um, and then in 2013, you can say, um, this is, this is, I've pulled this actually from a nat Natural Products Insider, which is actually a natural products um, industry organization website. Um, less than a third of companies are doing everything they can to ensure top-notch products. It goes on, this is actually just from this past March. So 15 dietary supplement reinspections or nearly one quarter of all of them resulted in citations for failing to establish product specifications. Setting, setting product specifications and um, 
have noted as a basic requirement. And these are the, the, the components that I spoke about earlier, which is if you're not actually defining standards for the product that you're manufacturing and you're not measuring it against it, then there's absolutely no way to make any inferences about any evidence that exists out there in terms of whether a particular supplement is beneficial or not. Um, what's quite frightening is that, um, and this is quoted again from the same website, is that many manufacturers are not even aware of FDA regulations, even though they've been in place you know, for nine years now. And, that, and this is also quite frightening. Most dietary supplement companies don't have laboratories and they don't have qualified people to es establish the correct specifications and actually do the testing. And so I'd written about this in, in a post earlier this year, which was what's in your traditional Chinese medicine. Adulteration and contamination of products are not uncommon. And testing actually shows that this problem is pervasive in supplements. And there's a, there's a process that's been followed and it's been criticized and I think somewhat, somewhat fairly, it's called DNA barcoding and it's looking at um, DNA signatures within products and testing them to determine whether or not there are, um, whether or not what's on the label is actually in the bottle. And DNA barcoding suggests that there's significant quality issues in the products that are sold. You can take a look at an, an old, old post that was done earlier this year where I elaborated on this issue a bit more. And the, um, the website Vox actually has an entire um, website dedicated, web page dedicated to looking up supplements to determine whether or not they've been adulterated or contaminated. And I think what this tells me is that there's persistent signs that consumers may be at real risk of harm from these products. Um, and what's interesting is that it's not necessarily accidental. There are these, some of these products are adulterated with synthetic supplements. Um, it's not necessarily uncommon. There are some very, very bad players in this industry and what that, what that means is that the good players, it's very difficult to distinguish who the good players are from the bad players in the industry. What's, what's promising is that industry is reacting. So um, GNC has actually agreed to Im enhance and improve their supplement quality and they're going, they've agreed to go beyond what is required from a minimum regulatory perspective. And I think that that's a smart move because, again, I don't think it's possible to use supplements in a science-based way if we can't actually be confident that what's on the label is actually in the bottle. I think the last piece that I want to mention in terms of the differences is around potency and, and stability. And as I said, with drug products, they must meet specific, specific standards for quality. They must test the stability of that, and they will assign expiry dates based on that. There's no FDA requirement for supplements to actually have an, an expiration date, and I can see why, because if you don't actually know what the active ingredient is, you can't test for that active ingredient in your supplement, and you can't actually measure the decay or whether that active ingredient is being destroyed. So I'll just close a couple, couple slides about you know, how can we use supplements uh, safely. I, as again, I, I believe very strongly that it's important for consumers to, to make their own decisions about their health, and, and I want to help to support the creation of an environment and where people can make decisions about choosing supplements in a way that is beneficial to their health and not harmful to their health. So I think that when you're looking at my general perspective around the safe, safer to the more risky um, types of supplements, again, I won't spend much time talking about homeopathy because as you know there's, there's nothing there. I think in general probably the multivitamins and minerals are probably among the, the safer products because they're treated more like pharmaceuticals. They can be measured and they can be assayed. And a lot of those are actually manu manufactured by pharmaceutical companies. The amino acids and the non-sport supplements, again, can be manufactured more according to pharmaceutical standards. Um, herbal remedies and some of the traditional Chinese medicines, um, this is where we get into concerns about adulteration and contamination and whether or not the manufacturer who's actually selling the product is actually testing those products to ensure that they're not contaminated and adulterated. And I've left the sports supplements at the bottom simply because the adulteration in that group of that category of products seems to be far more pervasive than in any other, any other category of supplements. And I'd blogged about that as well. So I guess kind of the, the bottom line is that um, supplement quality is really unclear, which I think makes it difficult for us to make effective health de decisions about our health. Um, and it's very difficult to use supplements in evidence-based ways. If you ask me whether a particular supplement can be taken safely with a drug product that you're taking, it's very difficult for me to answer. I can look into references where there have been controlled trials or where that particular interaction has been studied. But unless I actually know that what's, in, what's on the label is in the bottle, I don't actually know that the substance that you're taking has the same active ingredients as the particular product that you're asking me about. And so I think that... It, it, and this is odd for a pharmacist to say, but I think that brands with respect to supplements probably do matter. But I think that the challenge is, is that we don't actually know which brands necessarily are the products that are of the highest quality and are the safest to take. I think that like 
any health decision that you're making or any product that you're taking, whether it's prescription or non-prescription, we need to think about the expected benefits and the possible risks. And I think it's important to keep in mind that with supplements that the evidence of benefit, when there are clinical trials that actually do show a supplement may be useful and beneficial, and, and there are cases where that can occur, is that we don't always know that that's reproducible. We don't always know that that's the case. And finally, just if you're taking prescription drugs or you have other medical conditions, you need to be exceptionally cautious. I, as I said, unless I have the confidence in a particular supplement, I'm very leery to recommend any supplement use uh, or encourage it in any way just because of the unpredictable nature and the, the, the way in which these products are available on the market. Jan's going to get into a bit more about the, the regulations. Um, and so at this point, I will thank you very much.